whatever we do, when it comes to God, is done because of our love of God, our belief in God, and especially our love of Jesus Christ and our belief in Him to be the only begotten Son of God. It's interesting when I turn over to Revelation chapter 2 that I find a letter to the church at Ephesus from Jesus. And he says in verse 4, But I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. How do you do that? If you wonder what that squealing is, I don't know either. It's back here. Is that what I sound like when I preach? <laughs> Oftentimes in our emphasis on a proper faith always exhibits itself in obedience. And we emphasize that we should be obeying God, and rightly so. It's very easy to get to where you just do those things that are taught in the Bible, but then we forget why we did them in the first place. We did them in the first place if we did them rightly because we love God, because we love Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. We did it because we have faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by Him, John 14, 6. So this morning, I want us to realize that's a good possibility of what is meant here. The Ephesians were just doing these things. They were doing what was right, but they left the first love. They're doing these things. We're not done because we love the Lord. We do them because we want to show our love to the Lord. And our love of the Lord to everybody else that sees us do these things. So I would urge upon you, for anybody who's considering becoming a Christian, that you're not ready to become a Christian. And that could be for various reasons. But you must love your Lord with all that you have and are. And you must have faith, not just mentally assenting to the fact that he's the son of God, but the kind of faith that trusts him, takes him at his word, has confidence in him as the way, the truth, and the life, as the only mediator between God and man, as the one who's paid the price for your sins because he was tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. Thus, as the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, he goes to the cross and he dies there for all men so that our sins can be forgiven. It's a matter of keeping things in the right spiritual, biblical perspectives. Well, Jesus in his earthly ministry did a number of things. But there were startling claims that Jesus made. We read of them so much if we're good students of the Bible they may not startle us like they did when he did them in the flesh before men. And I ask you now, have you ever been startled? Well, I think we all have. Sometimes we've been taken by surprise to the point to where we actually jumped. And I want to talk about where Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the earthly ministry of Christ I want to talk about some startling claims of Jesus Christ. I want to do that because we must keep our focus on Christ and love Him as we love the Father. And have faith in Him, as I described it a moment ago. A faith that leads us to obey Him. And to keep in mind that if we leave our first love, we can keep doing what the Bible says. But then in the heart, why are we doing it? Is it because we love the Lord? It is because we have faith in Him as the only one who can save us from our sins according to His terms. 
Jesus said one time, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. <coughs> he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John 8, verse 8. He is to the spiritual realm what our sun is to our solar system. Notice he didn't claim to be a light among many lights. But he said, I am the light. Only that light will accomplish what Jesus came to do for us. Jesus is that true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. John 9, 1 verse 9. You remember Jesus is a babe that the aged Simeon acclaimed him saying, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Luke 2 verse 32. So one of the startling claims of Jesus was that he is the light. There is no other light. Mohammed will not get you into glory. He can't save you from your sins. Buddha won't do you any good. Only, only, only Jesus Christ of Nazareth has a gospel, glad tidings, good news that can save you from your sins. It is the power of God to save you, Romans 1.16. So he made that startling statement. I started once this morning. I thought it would take up so much time. And we're trying to abbreviate things a little bit this morning. Because Jonathan probably would have done this for me. I was going to have him follow me to the pulpit. As soon as I got up here, I was going to have him stand there and look out at you all with all serious and say, I am the light. Well, I think you'd probably, you might not be startled, but you'd say, Probably you say, what did David put him up to now? But, but, but the point is, you wouldn't be expecting it. Well, you must remember, Jesus walked this earth, and the prophecies of his looks was that he was not a handsome person. He was just an ordinary person for the Jews of that time. He looked like everybody else, so to speak. And yet he would stand there before people in an all solemnity and seriousness, say, I am the light of the world. And that would take you back some. And if you thought Jonathan really meant that about himself, it would startle you and it would cause a little bit of concern, I think. But then he said also this. He openly asserted that he was sent into the world with a mission from the Father. I am not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. Verse 16. And then again he said, and he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, verse 29. And not only did he say that the Father had sent him, but this gave even greater testimony unto him. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me, verse 18. Now, where could you find anybody else in the world as a sane creature who would make such a statement like that? Who else would claim such a mission? Those are startling things. They were to the people of his day. But there's another one. Jesus claimed to be the manifestation of God the Father, and that really did knock the Jews back on their heels and even more so. He said to them in verse 19, Ye neither know me nor my Father. If you had known me, ye should have known the Father also. Verse 19. Then on another occasion, Jesus said, When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. John 14, 9. And later, the Apostle Paul, inspired of the Holy Spirit, was to set forth this fundamental 
truth. Speaking of the Son, he said this, who is the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1, verse 15. And turning over to the inspired writer to the Hebrews, he declared him to be the express image of God, Hebrews 1, 3. Now, if what other character could that be said about? That's a startling statement, especially when you consider moving yourself back and moving among the ordinary people of that time and having him say these things. Notice this is not just a once in a while thing in his earthly ministry because we only have some of what Jesus said. This must have gone on over and over again as he walked throughout that country proving he was the only begotten Son of God, the Savior of the world. Jesus also surprised, startled, set them back on their heels. When he said, I am from above. I'm, I'm no ordinary prophet. I'm no ordinary man. Listen to him. Ye are from beneath. I am from above. Ye are of this world. I am not of this world. Verse 23. Now, if you were sitting there listening to somebody like this, he ain't not any different from you in the sense of ordinary human being. What would you think? This world wasn't his home. He belonged to another clime, if you please. Heaven itself, the home of deity. And while traveling in this world, Jesus had not severed his ties to heaven, where he came from, where his home was. Here's what he said. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven, John 3.13. And uh, he often reminded his own disciples, I am not of this world, John 17, 14, 16. And then even the 18th chapter in verse 36. Jesus had no problem whatsoever and unabashedly said to everyone that he was basically a leave of absence from heaven because he had a work to do on earth that only he could do. So that was a startling statement, I am from above. He startled people also when he says, for I do those things that please him. Jesus represented deity on earth, for he was deity in the flesh on earth. If you want to know how God would live as a man on earth, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you've got it. So he represented God as no other person ever did because he was God in the flesh. Now listen to him. He that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. Verse 26. What other person could say that? But Jesus said, And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. This is always, I, I read it, and I couldn't tell you how many times I've read it and preached it and taught it, but I still rock back on my heels when he says, For I do always those things that please him. Verse 29. What a statement. So Jesus was, however way anybody could be devoted, he was to that which willed, as God willed him to do. Notice he said it this way, For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. John 6, verse 38. And he could say, my meat, my sustenance, my food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work, John 4, 34. This devotion, this dedication enabled him to say toward the end of his ministry on earth, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. John 17, verse 4. But another one. 
To those who believed on him, here's what Jesus said. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. Then because some misunderstood, here's what he went ahead and said. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Verse 36. According to Luke 4.18, Jesus came to preach deliverance to the captives. In other words, we are pictured as being captive to sin, slaves to sin, cursed by sin. We can't save ourselves. No group of men can save us. No angels can save us. So the Son of Man, Jesus in the flesh, came to free sinners from the guilt of sin so they could actually have forgiveness of sin, stand justified before God to be saved from their sins. And they would, through following the New Testament, rightly divided, live in such a way as where Christ would say to them on the day of judgment, well done. Thou good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. So it's only through the Savior, and people like to talk a lot about freedom and liberty, but it's only through the Savior that true and genuine freedom can be obtained. And I guess one of those, moving on to another, startling statements Jesus made in this chapter is this, verily, verily, and that simply means it's a fact, it's the truth. It's the same Greek word from which we get amen, which means so be it, so be it. I say unto you, if a man keep my sayings, he shall never see death, verse 50. Now he's not talking about physical death, where James talks about the body apart from the spirit is dead, the best simple definition of physical death I can think of. He's talking about separation from God. You'll never see the second death. You'll never be eternally separated from God. So what manner of man will this to so audaciously assure eternal life to those who would keep his sayings? Well, you know, the Jews responded by a charge that he had devil. And just prior to demonstrating his great power over death by the resurrection of his friend Lazarus, Jesus plainly proclaimed, and this is amazing, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me Though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. John eleven twenty five through 26. How often has that passage of scripture been read by a grave prior to the erecting of the sacred mound over our loved ones. Christ is the hope of the world. We put our faith, our confidence, our trust in those words. And we dare not leave our first love, for we will be leaving, maybe not the doing of what he said, but the reason for doing what he said. Where is my confidence? Where is my love located? And then we'll come to the last one. I guess, again, this is, I don't know which one you say of these is more startling and amazing and attention-grabbing than the other, but possibly no statement he made was more difficult for the Jews than this one. Before Abraham was, I am, verse 58. Thus, he explicitly declared his eternal existence. Before becoming a man, becoming flesh, John 1, 14, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, 
And the same was in the beginning with God. John 1 verses 1 and 2. Thus before time and space and material things. Long before Abraham ever had being. The second person of the Godhead. The Lord, the eternal word. The executor of the Father's will was with the Father in eternity. And the scripture declares to us he put on flesh, born of a woman by the will of God. But he's the eternal word. He was coexistence with the one divine essence, the Father and the Holy Spirit being the other two persons of the great Godhead. Our Lord Jesus declared I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Verse 24. Again, we've got all of these in John, mostly chapter 8. Now, until one is fully willing to, to accept the evidence that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father but by Him, that He and He alone is our Savior. He and He alone is the author of eternal salvation. Unto all them that obey Him, Hebrews 5 and verse 9. Until that's a reality in your heart of hearts, and you're willing to give up anything and everything to obey Him because He's your plea. And without Him, you have nothing. Have you ever tried to sit down as a Christian and say, but what if I wasn't a Christian? What if Christ Jesus, I never knew? I never knew His gospel. I never knew His plan of salvation. I don't have a Bible you can't even imagine such a thing as that when you've been educated in the truth and lived it. He's the only one that can save us. Thus you must believe that Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. You must take him at his word for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And we will die in our sins, guilty of sin, if we don't believe that he is. And it's a belief that will always lead you to comply with his will. You'll look at Christ and say, if he had something to do, the Father assigned him. And he said all that mattered was doing it. And at the end of his life, he says, I've done it. In fact, on the cross, he simply says, it is finished. And yet look at the Apostle Paul. No greater among mortals ever served Christ than Paul. And toward the end of his days, he says to Timothy, I fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me this crown of life. He says it's for everybody that lives faithful to the Lord. If you are outside of Christ, you're outside of where God has located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Ephesians 1 verse 3. There is but one doorway into Christ for the one who has faith in Christ and has repented of sins and willing to confess him to be who he says he was and is, the Son of God. There's only one doorway. There is no other. Even as there was one doorway into the ark built according to God's specifications, there's one doorway into the ark of safety today, the spiritual body of Christ. That is being baptized into Christ to obtain the remission of sins. Galatians 3, 26 and 27 and Acts 2 and verse 38. He's the one who died for our sins. He's the one that overcame death, hell, and the grave, came forth from the grave. He can offer and does offer salvation to everybody who will humble themselves and with a whole heart believe and obey his will. This faith must be then an active and obedient faith. And for those to claim they are preaching Christ as Savior and then say, you don't have to have an active, obedient faith. 
They simply go contrary to everything the Bible explicitly and implicitly says to us concerning obedience to Christ as a manifestation of your faith. He promises us eternal life. Who does he promise that to? To those that keep his sayings. Startling statements of Christ. Common to the Bible student. Common to the one who's been saved by Christ. By their belief and obedience to the gospel. But don't ever let those common practices of Christ. What he said and what he did. Cause us to not be startled and amazed at what he did. They should. We should study the Bible with that kind of freshness. Now how much more could I spend on showing you what to do to be saved? As a child of God, if you have wandered from these things, repentance and confession of sins is necessary. We urge you then, if you need to obey the gospel to become a Christian, or if as a child of God you need to be restored to your first love, then now we offer you this invitation to come to Jesus while we stand and while we sing.